I'm Lisa Lepke from Pro Writing Aid, and it is editing week here at Pro Writing Aid HQ. And to be honest, it's always editing week here at Pro Writing Aid HQ, but normally we're more focused on the copy editing phase of editing because that's where the Pro Writing Aid editing tool has the biggest impact. Um, but we also are always aware that editing is a long process and it's got lots of phases, and we want to help you get all the way from your first really rough draft to your final manuscript. And so my guest today is Christina Stanley, um, and she's gonna help us understand how to do a really thorough story edit. Um, she's the best-selling author of the Stone Mountain Mystery Series. She also has many years of experience as a professional editor, and most recently she is the creative force behind the Fictionary editing software, which if you haven't tried it yet, you have to go and try it. Um, Haley, can you drop a link to Fictionary as well? Um, Christina, welcome. Hi everybody, so thank you Lisa. I'm super thrilled to be here. Amazing how many people are online and have an interest in story editing, which is my true life passion. So I'm excited to share with you. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, great. And... Um, just before I hand over to you, I just wanted to mention that in celebration of editing week, um, Christina and I are gonna offer, we've created a Fictionary and Pro Writing Aid bundle. Um, and the two software, if you were to buy them individually, normally would cost about $270. But this week, we're gonna, we've created a bundle for $99. Um, so Haley is also going to drop a link for that. Yeah, there it is. Um, and there's another option where you can add some human editing to the bundle as well. Tomorrow night, we have Joella Nordstrom joining us. Um, she's from First Editing, and she's going to help us understand how to get the best out of your editor once you're finished with your story edit and your copy and your copy editing. Um, and so now I'm going to disappear and I'm just going to hand over to Christina and she's going to take you through about a half an hour of training and then I'll be back for a Q&A. So thanks again everybody for being here and Christina, over to you. Okay, terrific. Let me just share my screen here. So uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, I guess so up, out of the gate, let's just um, I kind of packed a lot into this half an hour and my goal is what I'd like to do is give you some actionable things that you can leave with uh, to go and work on your own story. So I'm going to cover what is story editing. Um, I'm going to cover the most common story issue that writers have. And this is based on six months of research with editors all over the world. And I asked them, what are your writers struggling with when you see a draft come in that you're working on from a story structure perspective? So we're gonna cover that. Then I'm gonna talk you through some story elements so you can evaluate your own story and revise it. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the importance of the first scene and then at the end, I'll end with a checklist that you can take and use as you're revising your own draft. Okay, so what is story editing? So this is um, how I visualize the writing process. In the middle, you write your draft. Um, once you have a story written, and it doesn't have to be a full out strong draft, it's just a story. So you have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you generally have it there. Then you can start a story edit, and that will then lead you into a copy edit, which is pro writing aid. Um, and then after a copy edit, you wanna proofread, and then you want to publish. And in there, you may want to go to from using software tools to using professional editing. And as Lisa mentioned, Joellen will be here from first editing tomorrow. Um, and I'll talk about the importance of story edit leading into a professional editor as well. Okay, so let's first look at what is story editing. So it's also called structural editing, developmental editing, substantive editing. And when I first started writing and looking at all of these things, they, those terms didn't mean anything to me. And what I was really trying to do was figure out how to tell a powerful story. And so that's why we call it story editing. And it's really when you're looking at your entire manuscript, you're looking at your characters, your plot and your settings in the context of your overall story and you want to review and revise it so you make the strongest story possible. So um, when you want a story edit is after you've, you have a, a draft written. And the whole goal of the story edit is really, it's to tell a powerful story. And a powerful story, all that means is that it's a story that creates emotion in the reader and keeps the reader engaged. And everybody has a different type of book they love to read. So some people read thrillers, some people read literary fiction, some people read mysteries like me. Um, but 
what you want from your story is you want to share an emotional experience so the reader can't put it down. So you can't do any of that until you have a draft written. So like I mentioned, you want to do this before copy editing and proofreading. And the reason I say that, and particularly if you're going to hire a professional copy editor or a proofreader, you don't want to waste your money um, doing that work when you're still going to be changing your structure, you're going to be moving scenes around, paragraphs around. And so there's really no point in doing that work until um, you actually have done your story edit. You want to do it before sending to beta readers. And beta readers are hard to find and it's hard to find good ones. So once you do, you want to keep them and you want them focused on your story and you don't want them looking, oh, there's a big plot hole here, or I don't like this character, or, I don't know who this character is, any of that stuff that you can fix yourself. The higher quality you send to the beta reader, the, the easier it's gonna be for them to give you constructive feedback. Um, before sending to a professional editor, and for story editing, here's where I think this is critical. So your book is your book, and it's your artistry that goes into this book, and you're telling it. And when an editor comes back and tells you certain things, you want to be able to push back and say, well, no, I did it for this reason and be confident in your reason and not just follow what an editor is saying. Um, I'm a story editor myself. And so I love it when, when a writer has an opinion and says, okay, I see what you're saying, but I did this because of this reason. And then you can have a conversation about it and you don't have to just trust the editor because they're one person in the world looking at your book and it's your story. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to the most common issue. All right, so it was kind of an interesting process to go through because I had my own view of what writer's issues were based on the books that I've edited. And um, what I found was that it wasn't quite exactly what I thought. And what came back is a lot of writers are struggling when they're trying to do a story edit and knowing what a scene is. And by that, I mean, I know everybody knows what a scene is, but where do you start it? Where do you end it? How do you structure your novel? How do you edit just on the scene basis and make sure it fills into your entire story? And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to talk about scenes um, and how you can look at your scenes and have one scene lead to the next scene, lead to the next scene in a, in a nice concrete flow that's going to create a great story for you. So let's just talk about a scene. Um, so a scene is basically a section of a novel where a character or characters engage in action or dialogue. So what this means very simply is a scene is where your characters are doing something. That's it. And a character can be uh, an inanimate object, it can be a haunted house, it can be a person, it can be an animal. It doesn't, it doesn't mean it has to be a, a human being. It's just whatever the character is that, that you have. And um, so they're doing something. The plot within the scene, so every scene will have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so you need to know how to start it, you need to know how to get through the middle, and you need to know how to end it. So very similar to your entire novel, but a little piece of it. And then every scene will take place somewhere. So you have settings. You may have more than one setting or location within a scene, um, or you may not, uh, but every setting is super important to what you're doing with your story. Okay, so um, what I wanna talk about here is how to start your story edit. So you're gonna imagine you've got your 80,000 words or 50,000 or 120,000, whatever it is for your genre and your story. And you're going to read through it and you're gonna look at every place where the point of view character changes, where the location changes or where the time changes and mark your manuscript up. And the reason this is important is these are key places where you could start a new scene. So if you've kind of written your story, especially if you're a panster, uh, which I am, you, you might have written it without thinking logically, where should you start and end scenes? And it's important because when you end a scene, it's giving your reader a break. And what happens when you give your reader a break, they can take a breath and that's great, but this is a point where they may put your book down because they've come to a nice break. So it's critical that you've written your scene that makes them wanna start another scene. 
Um, and I'll just make one little comment about scene break characters here in that with the technology today, it's changed the way we have to write. And the reason it's done that, when you uh, upload your book onto a Kindle, so say you're selling an ebook, you don't know where the page breaks are gonna hit. And a scene break character gives the reader a place to look um, so that you, they know a new scene is starting and it triggers for them that something is changing in the scene. And it can be one of these things, and there's other ways, reasons for scenes to change, but these are kind of the top three runners. And you wanna make it super easy for your reader. So at this point, when you're starting your, your, your story edit for the first time, if you go through your novel and you mark each place where you have a point of view character change, and I'll talk about that in a minute, location change, time change, that'll give you a starting point of how to break out your scenes for your reader to make it easy and enjoyable for them to read your book, which is really important. Okay, when you put in scene break characters, it'll give you a visual eye for one, but you'll also see as soon as you start a new scene, the scene before it, you ended it. So now you've got, you've got scene beginnings and scene endings. And here, you wanna check that you leave with a good exit hook. So at the end of a scene, you want either uh, a cliffhanger, so everybody knows what that is. You could do an unanswered question, a plot twist, a secret reveal, part of a secret reveal, the revelation. There's many things you can do here, but what's important is you want to leave the reader engaged so that they want to read that next scene. And they may not be reading it then, it may be bedtime and they're done for the night, but you want them the next day to be thinking, oh, I have to get back and see what happens. So. All of these things leave a question in the reader's mind. And with that, it will draw the reader along and keep them reading your story. Okay, so um, where we're at now is basically you've taken your draft and now you've broken it out into scenes. And you can do chapters later, um, or you can do it at the same time. I like to, I kind of do my chapters, but then I look where my scene breaks are and see, is there a theme with the scenes and should, how should I group them together? When you first go through and you break into scenes, don't worry about the word count. Um, just do the scenes logically for the flow of your story. And then you can go back and look at word count per scene and decide, are any of them too long? Are they too short? And I say that because um, you may decide that you're cutting some of the scenes, you may decide based on evaluating the story elements we're about to talk about, that you're going to add a whole bunch of things to a scene and make the word count longer. So don't stress about word count at this point in the story edit, that can come at the very end. Okay, so now you have everything broken out into scenes. And what I recommend is that you name each scene. And on the right here, I've got uh, one of my novels where I've named my scenes um, as, as I was going through and doing my story edit. And I, I recommend three words or less, and here's why. If you can name a scene in three words or less, you know what the main point of the scene is. If you can't, maybe you don't. Um, when you name it in three words or less, you have an afterdraft outline. And so this gives you a very quick way to look at the structure of your story and see, does it make sense? Are they in the right order? Um, and you can use it as a reference as you edit. So what that means, if you want to move scenes around, you can um, see where they fit in the context of other scenes. So as long as the three words give you enough that you know what the scene is about, then it comes in very handy. And I'm not saying put the scene name inside your manuscript. You don't need to do that because the reader doesn't need the name of the scene. This is for you as your story editing. And you'll see down at the bottom, I have one scene that's called Dog Walk, Meet Vicky. So there, mm, I might not have a focus on that scene. I'll talk about that here. When I'm talking about the, I'm gonna talk about the purpose of the scene next. So here, you need to define the purpose of a scene. Oops, sorry, that's my clock. Um, as to why your scene, why the scene is in a story. And the reason this is important, we all get carried away writing, and sometimes you write a scene that seems great when you're writing it, but when you look at it in the context of your story as a whole, it doesn't make sense for the story you're telling. And so you need to know why is every scene in your story. Um, and once you know why, does the purpose relate to the overall plot? So um, it all has to come back to your main storyline and 
each scene has to be there for a reason. So the scene where I said I had two names for it, it probably indicates to me as a writer, well, maybe it's two scenes or maybe I didn't quite get a strong purpose in it. I don't really know what it's for. It's kind of wavering. And that's a scene I would go back because I couldn't name it in three words or less. And I actually put two different, two different scene names on it. I have to go back and figure out what that's for. The other thing is, um, that's a small example, but you can have scenes with way too many purposes. And, and if it gets that, the scene starts to, um, it'll confuse the reader. And so you want to really look at what is the main purpose. And then I look at, I go through my list and I keep track. Um, and here's just a little screenshot in Storyteller of the types of things I'm doing. So at the beginning, it's a character introduction. And then maybe I have some character development, um, building suspense, that sort of thing. And that's what I mean by the purpose of the scene. Okay, so now we've got the scenes, we've got them named, we've got them structured. We know what the purpose is. So now it's all about the character. And when you choose a point of view, and the point of view is the, the character that your reader is gonna experience the scene through. So they're going to see it, they're going to feel it, they're going to touch it, whatever. All of the senses, their emotions, their actions are from that character's perspective. And that's how your reader um, will pick up on it. Or sorry, will experience this, this scene. So you're promising them that. So in modern fiction, um, the trend really is not to head hop. And head hop means you're doing more than one point of view in a scene. Now, of course you can. And again, I wanna stress it's your book and, and you're the artist here. And what I wanna do here is make you aware of it. And so when you do it, or if you do it, you know you're doing it and you're doing it for a reason that's best for the story you're telling. Um, so with head hopping, it means we're skipping from one person's point of view to another. And it can jar the reader from the story. It can cause confusion. It will make you use extra words um, and it can slow the pacing. So if we look at this little picture down here and we've got this man and he's teaching his class and let's say his wife left him that morning. So in his thoughts, he's very distracted and he's thinking about that and he's trying to teach his class. If you jump to somebody in the class who now it's a different point of view, you have to, to avoid confusion, use extra words to be clear that the thought, the action, you know, if the teacher points, you need to now say it's the teacher pointing. Um, whereas if it was somebody in the class, if you've gone to their point of view, it's their actions, their senses, and you need to add the extra words to make it clear. Um, it can also reduce suspense in the story if you know what both sides are saying. So. Um, if the reader knows, for example, his wife left him because of one of the people in the audience, but he doesn't know it, the suspense will stay there because the reader will know they're in the audience, but they don't know what the audience member is thinking. And so when you, when you do head hop, you want to make sure you're doing it for a reason and be very careful about it. Okay, so your action for a point of view in, in self-editing is to list the point of view character for each scene. And you want to keep that list going. And when you've done your whole book for every scene, then you want to look at who is your protagonist and do they have the most number of point of view scenes. And if a different character does, you might want to think about maybe that other character is actually the protagonist and it's not the one you thought it was. And that does happen to writers after they do a draft. So, you know, don't be surprised if that happens to you. It's fine. If you just want to relook at your, your story and there's two things you can do there. You can either change some of the point of views, or you can write the story from a different protagonist perspective. So here, what I'm showing you with this story that I've, I've put in Storyteller is, so Kaylin is the character who has the most points of view, but what you can also see here is that I have a ton of point of view characters. Well, that's too many. Your book should have five, no more than seven. There are, of course, examples um, that work really well. Game of Thrones is a great one of ton of points of view. Um, when you're starting out, you want to be very careful and keep your writing tight um, for several reasons. Um, and one is that the reader needs time to connect and care about your characters. And if you're writing just a standalone novel, you're not going to have enough time to make that happen. And if the reader doesn't care about your characters, they're not going to read your book. Um, you also want to look at your first scene and 
it's your point of view, is your protagonist the point of view character for that scene? Now, it's okay if it isn't. Harry Potter is a good example where he's not, but he is mentioned in the scene and it sets up the whole thing. So if you don't have your protagonist as your first point of view character, think about why, and it's, it should be a good reason. Of course, this only applies to multi point of view stories. If you're writing from one point of view in the eye perspective, it's just that one person. Um, and then the other thing, if you are writing multi point of view, you want to look at the balance. So an unbalanced point of view is when you have um, the one example of your protagonist doesn't have enough uh, scenes or too many scenes go by between points of view character and your reader can't remember who they are or you have five scenes from one character and then one, two, three, four, five scenes from five different characters and then two, and there's no pattern to it. And the reader starts to get confused about whose story it is. You wanna be careful and, and keep things balanced. Okay. So now that you have, you know who your point of view characters are, the next thing your point of view characters need are goals. And if the character doesn't have a goal in every scene, and I mean every scene, what are they doing? They're doing nothing. Without a goal, they're doing nothing. And so nobody's going to read that scene. And they might even put your book down. So there's an external goal, which is, um, so for a murder mystery, the external goal of the protagonist is usually solve the murder. Um, and then they will have external goals per scene, and it might be examine the crime scene, would be a goal for the opening scene, perhaps. Um, but they'll also have internal goals. And the internal goal is really usually related to some character flaw that they may or may not know about, but they need to fix. And it will be related to their character arc. So if you had a detective in your murder mystery who is really squeamish um, or, and you know has a paranoia that it's a true flaw that stops him from entering or her from entering a crime scene room because he can't get over it, he's got to get over that. Um, you know, there's all kinds of internal flaws. So the, both the external and internal have to relate to the overall story. They can't just be random goals. There must be something that is driving the story for it. And the other thing, there must be consequences. So if you give a character an external goal and they fail and nobody cares, it doesn't matter. I want to drink water, I didn't get it. Okay, move on. It doesn't, it doesn't drive the story forward and it's not going to create tension. And so when you create a goal, even if the character succeeds in that scene or in a future scene, um, you as the writer need to understand that there's something of high value at stake for that character. And then the reader is going to care if they make that goal or not. And the final thing I'll say about goals is don't solve them too quickly or don't let the protagonist or the point of view character achieve them too quickly and too often. So there needs to be enough failure. And again, it comes back to balance so that the reader won't start thinking, well, this character succeeds at everything. So why am I reading this story? Okay, so the sneaky things about point of view goal. One is it may feel like there's a goal, but it could be a goal that's not related to the story. And so then it's not a goal at all. Uh, there could be too many goals for a scene and then um, the scene starts to feel episodic and the reader doesn't really know what the character is trying to get and so they don't know what to cheer for. Readers like to cheer for things and they like to be worried about it. Um, if the goal is inconsistent with a character's personality. So a very simple example, if, if you had established early on, for example, a character drinks tea and then later they're trying to do an overnighter and they're desperate for a cup of coffee. Well, they're a tea drinker. And so that's an inconsistency and their goal doesn't make sense. The goal has no consequences, which we talked about. And also if, if the goal is achieved too easily, it's not really a great goal. Okay, then we talked about um, characters, we talked about plot and so settings. So this contains one of my favorite um, story elements. So when you choose your setting, you want to choose it carefully because it has a major, major impact on the story. And also, um, it, you need to decide how important the setting is to each scene, and that's going to determine how much time you spend on describing each location within a scene. And it can make the difference between a boring and an exciting scene. 
Um, and I want to use two examples here. One is Stephen King. Um, so if you look at his horror novels, he will spend a lot of time describing something. And when he does that, you know that there's something about the room he's describing that's really important to the story. And so you pay attention. Um, another one is Ken Foley, and he wrote a book called White Out. And when I read it, I read every word. And normally I'm a description skimmer. It's just my thing. And I went back and actually highlighted every piece of description in that book and discovered he only described things that were related to the plot. And so when you're describing your settings, um, it's really important to think about what, how is what you're describing related to, this, to the story. And the other thing is what's the emotional impact of the setting? And um, what that means, so another example for that would be, so you have a thunder and a lightning storm. And there's a couple sitting on a hilltop and they're watching it in the distance. Well, that's very romantic and that sets a mood. And if they are out on a sailboat in the ocean, it's not so romantic and rather terrifying. So that's a completely different mood. And so when you're choosing a location for a scene, choose it based on what you want the reader and the characters to feel. Okay, so some of the setting issues. Um, all right, so if there's too much or too little description, which I talked about how to decide what you wanna do. If it's unclear where a scene is taking place, that's fine if the character doesn't know where they are, that's okay. Then the reader shouldn't know where they are either. Um, but if they do, the reader needs to know where they are and it needs to be obvious early in the scene where it's happening. Uh, this description needs to be consistent with the point of view character so I'm a dog lover. When I walk down the street, my eye goes to a dog. It doesn't go to a cat or a squirrel or whatever. So it's consistent with my personality. You don't want to use the easy cliche locations of, you know, a couple having a fight in a coffee shop, that kind of thing. And you want to be careful that your locations aren't repetitive just for ease of use. Um, it's okay to be repetitive if that's the point of the story and they're always in the same place and that's fine but it's not if it's just the easy go-to. Okay, so that is settings. Coming up on my half hour here, so I'm almost done. Um, the last thing I wanna cover is tension, and it's a plot story element, and you have to have tension in every scene. It is what keeps a reader reading. Um, and if your readers don't care about your characters, there won't be any tension. So you need to go through the effort to make your readers care about your characters. And once you've done that, you have to look at every scene and look at, well, is there tension? And I, I just wanna say a quick little thing about tension versus conflict. So tension is the expectation that something bad is going to happen and conflict is the bad already happening. So the bad, or sorry, conflict is the, it's the fight, it's the argument, um, it's not the, there's going to be a fight or there's going to be an argument or there's going to be an accident. It's the foreshadowing that's leading up to the reader knows, has a feeling something's going to go wrong. It's not going to be good, but when it happens, that's the conflict. And that's how you know the difference between the two. Okay. So the first scene, um, super important in your book. So now you go on Amazon you look for books, oh, I like this author. You read the sample, mm, I don't like it. Next, you go to the next one, next one, next one. It's all free, it's a fun exercise to do. So it's very easy for readers to look at your first scene and decide, am I reading this book or not? So some things that you can put into a first scene to help that is it, your first scene should always kick off or set up the inciting incident. So the inciting incident doesn't have to be in your first scene, but everything in your first scene should make the inciting incident um, believable. And the inciting incident is just the point where you uh, shift your, your protagonist's world. So something's happened and the world has changed dramatically. Um, and it usually comes kind of 15% into your story. If you can, you want to introduce the protagonist in your first scene. Books with prologues often don't. Um, but if you're not having a prologue, you should think hard about introducing your protagonist. You should give the reader a taste of what the ordinary world is and what struggles the protagonist is having so that 
when the inciting incident happens, the reader understands why this change is going to be difficult for the protagonist. There should be dramatic tension and, and, and that just means you're, you're, you know, the reader is feeling a bit edgy and they get that it's foreshadowing something and it should also set the tone. So if you're writing something with humor, you should be humorous in the first chapter. If you're writing a thriller, it should be thrilling in the first chapter and so on, or the first scene, sorry. And so whatever genre you're writing, know your genre and set the tone right away. If it's supposed to be funny, the reader will expect that on page one. And if it's not, they're not gonna read further. Okay, so the no-nos of a first scene. One is too much backstory. So every piece of backstory you put early on in the book, which you did through the whole book, but really important in the first scene is, do you need it? Does the reader need to know that to understand and be excited by the scene? Um, I don't recommend a flashback. A flashback means you're taking the reader out of the story and making them start another story. And doing that early on means they're not connected yet and they might not read further. Description list. So there, I mean, describing something in the form of a list. You know, she has blue eyes, blonde hair, wearing a blue jacket. People are going to skim that and then think, okay, it's not very exciting. Don't explain too much. Just give the action something happening. Um, and then the reader can figure out the rest later. And that's why they're reading your book is because they want to figure out the rest later. And don't try and introduce every character in the first scene. You don't need to do that. It just the key ones, ask yourself why it's each character in the scene and only put the ones in there that you need for that scene. All right, so that's that. Um, I'll try and get a little faster here, sorry. Um, so a checklist for every scene. So what we covered at the beginning is Go through your manuscript and break it into scenes. And then you want to look at your scene opening and your scene closing, and you want to make sure there's an opening hook. So what, when the reader looks and reads the first few sentences, is going to keep them engaged and not put your book down. And the closing hook is what's going to engage them that they want to read the next scene, that there's something there. You want to name your scene. You want to make sure uh, the scene has a purpose and you know what it is. Um, then you want to look at who's got your point of view and what their goals are. And then you look at your location, the emotional impact of your location. And then the final thing, once you have all of that together, is you read back through and go, okay, is there tension in every scene? Okay, so that's your checklist to take with you. I just wanted to show you quickly. So within Fictionary, all of the things we've talked about, so we've talked about nine of the story elements and there's 38. Um, so you can see your book right beside them and you can evaluate each scene. And here is just showing you the plot. It has character plot setting at the top and it's just showing you um, the, some of the plot elements that I could put in, fit into the screen that I evaluate when I'm looking at my own story. Okay, so once you've done all of that, that's all of the scene by scene stuff um, in your story elements, then you wanna go back and have a look at your story arc. And you can look at a very simple form of the story arc, which is five points, your inciting incident, plot point one, the middle, plot point two, and the climax. And there, so these again are guidelines, it's your story. And all I'm trying to do is encourage you here is think about it. And if you're not meeting these guidelines, think about why. So the inciting incident should be before 15% in your story. And if it's not, there needs to be enough tension and conflict at the beginning to keep the reader reading because they're expecting something major to happen. Um, plot point one should be between 20 and 30%. If these two are too close together, your story's gonna lack depth. Too far apart, the reader's gonna start waiting for it. Then you get to the middle, plot point two and the climax, um, same thing. And you know, just to give you an example of when you might want to break the rules, if you're writing a trilogy or a long series and it's clear you're doing that, the reader will expect the resolution to be a little bit longer than it would be if you were writing a standalone book. So they will expect more of a lead in to the next and if you, not a cliffhanger, because that is annoying to readers, but enough um, setting up the tension for the next book that they can't wait to get to the next book. So there's some questions left unanswered, et cetera, to get to the next book. So there it's okay to move your climax earlier so you have enough time. So the goal here is just to know um, that your story is sort of around it. Okay, so I wanna leave you with um, some editing books. 
And these are books I love. And I find when I'm editing, editing my own work, um, if I get stuck, when I go and read a book on editing, it sparks my creativity and it helps me think about different ways to look at my book. It deepens my knowledge so that, you know, I pay attention to it when I'm writing my next book and it helps me finish. So I love reading books. Um, my favorite on this list, if I were to pick one, is Make a Scene by Jordan Rosenfeld. And um, it's a very practical way of looking at every scene in your book. And it will give you a lot of the theory behind what we've talked about kind of very quickly today. Um, and um, so, and the others on my list are just ones that I, I found, um, you know, easy to read, but full of really good information if you truly want to understand what's going on with this story edit. Okay, so tools, of course, I'll talk a little bit about Fictionary and we built Storyteller because story editing is hard and Fictionary makes it easier. And so it goes through 38 story elements, it draws your story arc for you, it links characters to scenes, all of that stuff. Pro Writing Aid works within Fictionary, which we love. So that's the whole copy editing side, which I'm pretty sure everybody on this call knows what Pro Writing Aid is. So I you know, don't need to go into detail there. But between the two, you can do your story editing and your copy editing on your own. And then I just wanted to finish, I just wanted to do a little reminder, which Lisa will put information in the link uh, where you can buy the bundle, but we've got Storyteller and for writing aid together for $99 instead of 260 and it's available till May 5th. And if you already have pro writing aid, but you want Fictionary, then you can use coupon code PWA2020 and get an annual subscription for $89 instead of the 200. And there's a 14 week um, story editing course included with that. So that's my little spiel. Now I just want to end, I like, before we go to questions, I like to end on something different about myself. So. Um, everybody is probably stuck at home. The last time I went out was May 1st, sorry, March 1st, which is a long time ago. And so what I'm doing to keep happy during this time is I train guide dogs. And these are the guide dogs that have been in my life. The top two are the same dog and that's Kinta and that she's with me there on the very last moments we had together before she left and went off to um, be a guide dog for a blind person. The one in the middle is Jan and she's with me now and she's 16 months old. And she's due to move to advanced training soon. And the one on the bottom is Candy. And she's been here four days and she's eight weeks old. And so she'll be with me for another year. And so to keep myself happy and distracted from this whole coronavirus thing, this is my fun in my life. So besides just working on your book and story editing, I really hope there's something fun in your life too that is getting you through this very crazy time. And that is it. It's true. I, before, before we went live, Christina brought little tiny candy in so that we could have a little peek out of her. She is stunning. Absolutely stunning. Um, it's great. That was, thank, that was great, Christina. Really good. We have about 10,000 questions here. So Excellent. Get straight to it. <laughs> one, of the, one of the big questions that lots of people are asking is if they can have... Um, when we send out the recording tomorrow, could they also have a copy of the slides just so that they can go through it? Because there was a lot yeah. of people saying it's going fast and I'm trying to take yeah. notes and it's yes. hard to keep up with everything. Yeah, yes. okay. So when we send, when you get a recording or a copy of the recording tomorrow um, from the Zoom software, we'll include a link for those as well. Perfect. And then where to begin with all these questions? There's a lot of, shall we just get through some of the questions about Fictionary first? Is that... That's sure. Really whatever whatever you see the question, I don't see them. So whatever you want to do, just go for it and I'll answer. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so can you use Fictionary to analyze the plot when you're still in the outline stage? Like for example, maybe using a single sentence for each scene. That's from Julia. Yes. Thank you, Julia. Great question. So there is um, an out um, start new novel function within Fictionary and we actually added it. Our intent was originally just to have after you had a first draft, but then we had too many writers who finished a first draft, wanted to stay in Fictionary and, and write from scratch. So we do now have an outline feature where you can do that. And what we found writers are doing is um, they're putting their outline in and then as they write their scenes, they're thinking about all the story elements that are sitting on the side beside their scene and they can look at, oh, okay, how am I opening, how am I ending? And it, it forces them to write 
their scenes as they're writing instead of writing a big long manuscript and then trying to fit it into scenes. And then trying to, yeah, that, I mean, that makes more sense to me. I'm more of a planner. And so that's, I think, how it would work for me. But it's good that it works both ways, depending whether you're a planner or a seat of the pantser. Yeah. Um, so if my, so Georgia wants to know if her plot points don't line up with the fictionary plot points, how does she fix it? Does she, okay. does she write to catch up by writing or to try and reach the plot points or try and designate them in the plot overview? So the first thing she wants to do, um, it's great to see that they don't line up and they don't have to line up perfectly. You just want to see they're in those ranges that I gave you. And that's fine. And if they're out of those ranges, you want to look at, do you have a reason like I gave for you're writing a, a trilogy and so you need more time for resolution? Is there a reason? Um, at the beginning, your inciting incident might come later if you're doing a very character driven novel and it's important to set up all the characters before whatever the inciting incident happens. So I just want to stress, don't feel like it has to be exact. If you do feel like, oh, my inciting incident really should be a little earlier, um, then you can move this scene around and the story arc will redraw for you. Um, or you can assign it to a different scene. So you could say, okay, actually my inciting incident, now that I've revised, is not really scene five, it's scene two. And so you can assign scene two, and we have videos and tutorials to show how to do that. Um, you can assign that and then the story arc will redraw and show you what it looks like at that point. Okay. It's very, can I just say, it's very satisfying to put your story into the software so it draws your story arc for you. And didn't you find when you put a lot of like bestseller, bestselling authors in there that almost everybody lined up almost yeah. exactly with, with, with each other? Yeah, and it's how I discovered why the story arc is broken. So Twilight, it's on exact. And it's a highly commercial successful book, right? It is dead on, boom, boom, boom. Um, the first Harry Potter book, her climax is way early, but when you look at what she sets up in the resolution, it, it shows that too, right? So, um, you know, the, the big successful books are all on it. And you, when you read them, if they're not, you can clearly see why they didn't do it. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, Martin says, as a pantser, um, doesn't this cramp your flow? No, so here's what happened to me. And part of the reason I developed this is, and, and lots of our writers tell us this too, that I write my draft as a pantser. I love the exploration and just writing, and that's what excites me about writing. So it's how I write. And there's a big argument out whether it's better to be one or the other. And I don't really care about that. Just write your story. When you go into fictionary, so you have your draft, you don't know what to do with it. And the goal of fictionary is to give you some back not boundaries, but guidelines of what to look at. So you're stuck at making it better and it should trigger your creativity. So it's not in any way designed to say you have to do these things. It's designed to say, here are some things behind the question marks on every element. There's an explanation of why it's important and how to use it. And then you can decide. And um, quite often what it does for writers, it helps them get from that draft that they're stuck and they don't know what to do and they can't finish it and they can't afford an editor so they're really stuck it gives them a way to look at their own work and be creative and it's still their story it's just pushing them to look at it differently and see it differently when you see oh, look how many characters I had in this scene or look at the order of my characters or look at my word count per scene you can assess is it right or not yeah I mean it's a lot like pro writing aid in that way there's so many rules in pro writing aid that or suggestions that aren't rules you know if you if you feel like passive voice in this instance is the right thing to use and it works and it makes sense then then use it all it is is a trying to give you explanations and flag things that could be problematic and b helping you make the whole process a bit more bite-sized yeah. because when you have a whole manuscript or when you've written a whole first draft the idea of going and editing it all is so overwhelming Whereas with this, if it's like, okay, here's your scene, you have to answer these 10 questions. And that's, I just feel like it steers, it steers that whole process and makes it feel less daunting. Right. Yep. Okay, good. Um, let's see. Um, Carla says she, her story has two point of views, but when she op uploaded it to Fictionary, it identified other characters as POV right. characters. 
Yep, and that, that will happen. So, you know, we use natural language processing software to pull out the point of view character. So it doesn't always get it right. So what I recommend is as you're going through the scenes, you just use the drop down menu and flip it to the point of view that is actually the point of view for that scene. Um, and also change it if you change who the point of view is, then you can just use the drop down menu and, and it, it'll update it. And when you update it there, it updates all the insights on the visualize page to go with it. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, you have to remember this is a computer doing its very best to try and make sense of things, but some things it won't quite get right. Yeah, and I'll just say it has more trouble with fantasy novels because the names are not typical names that a computer would know is a person's name. Right. And it might also have trouble with, say, Virginia, which Virginia is a state and a person's name. It's trying to pull out the context, but it's difficult to depending on how the sentence is written, it, it, it can get that wrong, wrong. And so that's the reason why that happens. Okay, so no place names and character names that are that have crossover. <laughs> well, you can use them, totally use them, but it doesn't mean you've got to use the drop down menu. Don't change your names because of Fictionary. <laughs> you, just want to, you just want to reset the, the, the name in the, in the drop down. Okay, okay. Um, someone's asking if there are word count limitations. Can you, is there a limit to how long your book can be? No. no, and we took a 300,000 word novel and put it into one. So we did 900,000 words and threw it in to see it. Now, the story arc takes a little bit longer because it's trying to analyze the whole thing. So the longer it is, it gets a little bit slower, but no, you just let her rip. Okay, cool. Um, there's a few people who have asked about um, the length of a scene. Do you have a recommendation in terms of how long scenes should go and how scenes are related to chapters and what that proportion should be like? Yeah, so it all comes back to reader enjoyment. Um, and so the trend right now is shorter scenes because people are reading on, you know, their phone, tiny little phone or a smaller Kindle or whatever. And the scene can seem tedious if it's too long. So right now the trend is kind of 1200 words, but um, you can have a scene that's one word, it can be a sentence doesn't, you know, there's no lower limit. It could just be an impact thing that's a scene and you move on. Mm. Um, and challenge, literary, challenge accepted. <laughs> there you go. One word scene. Okay, really it has to relate to your plot, as you know, we talked about, but, or you can have, you know, literary novels tend to have longer scenes. And so um, what you want to do is, you know, when you're getting over 2000 words, 3000 words a scene, it, it's starting to get long for the reader. Um, and the other thing you want to do is you want to look at your novel as a whole and look at if there's any standouts. So if I wrote a novel where all of my scenes are kind of 800 to 1200 words, and then somewhere in the middle, I've got a 5,000 word scene. Well, the reader's going to get there and go, what is this? It doesn't fit with the pattern of this. And it's going to go yeah, on. You on. expect a rhythm. You get to know yeah. the rhythm. Right. And if it's not the climax scene, which may be, that's what you do. You save everything for the climax scene. Fine. But if there's not a reason for a scene being that long, that's a key scene to look at and go, well, let's see where I can split it. Where the point of view change, where the location change, the time change, the characters in the scene change, something that you could split it into more to make it easier for the reader. Just a bit more bite size. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, a couple of people have asked about memoirs. Do people use your software for memoirs and how do you use it differently if so? Um, so the only people who use it for memoirs are those who are writing um, a character driven memoir that's a that's a flow of a story. So they're telling an overall story. So it might be an event in their life and they're telling that story versus a memoir, which could be, you know, starting at a person's birth and how they got to uh, be a certain politician and, you know, that kind of memoir. So if it's a creative memoir where you're writing it so you could if you didn't know it was a memoir you could pick it up and it's a it's a just it's a story then yes it absolutely works because you want your person engaged in reading your memoir yeah i mean a memoir it, is is a story it needs to be a story first and foremost yeah. isn't it about so it just depends on how story like it is versus facts of a, of a memoir okay and what about short stories? Do people use Fictionary for short stories? And is there a different yeah, process? We try and discourage that a little bit. Um, so the story arc won't draw until there's enough scenes that it, the, the 
manuscript can be analyzed so it has all the plot points and enough scenes in between. So everything else works except the story arc when it's too short. Um, we do have some people use it because they write a lot of short stories and they put one in and they want to see their story has all of the elements and stuff. Um, but they lose the story arc part. Okay, and that's a good bit. But I yeah. think it could probably still be useful for making you think back and ask questions about each. And, and we've certainly had people do that, and that's that's great. Um, but you know, it's really designed for novella and novels. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. There's a few people asking about nonfiction as well, and I think that answers that question. Um. So Lawrence wants to know what's the difference between story editor and story coach. Okay. So. Um, not that much. So a story coach is really someone who's trained to be a story editor. The closer you go to uh, coach side, you're doing a lot more discussion. Um, both would cover the same thing. So the same topic area. Um, a story editor is going to give you your edit, all of the comments, notes, et cetera, off to you and you go and work. A story coach might be someone that you hire that you work with over a long period of time. Um, developing your story. Now, having said that, we have a story, a product called Story Coach, which is meant for story editors doing a story edit, so it gets a little bit confusing there. Okay, all right, fair enough. Um, a few people have asked about Scrivener as well. I think a lot of our users use Scrivener. Do you have crossover, or is this something to replace Scrivener? Uh, no, it's not replacing Scrivener. We love Scrivener. So Scrivener has a beautiful export function, mm -hmm. and so um, we have a lot of Scrivener users who use Fictionary, and so they write their draft in Scrivener. And I'm, I'm one, I've written one draft in Scrivener too, I like it, it's great. So, but what the, the nice thing about the two products together is Scrivener, you just tag your scene so that it exports with the word chapter and it puts a scene break character between every scene and you export it to a MS Word docx file and then import it right into Fictionary. So it's super easy to go from Scrivener to Fictionary. And, you know, Scrivener has really helped you focus on structuring your your manuscript into chapters and scenes, and then you can do the full out analysis in Fictionary. And then you go on okay. to co-writing and do all your copy editing. Boom, boom. Yeah. Boom. Well, then we can just come into Fictionary as well. Oh, you can write yeah. into Fictionary. Yeah. Just in case anybody isn't doesn't know, our Chrome extension works right in Fictionary. So once you've gone through all of the story editing process, you can just install the Chrome extension. And then for each scene, um, you can click it so it opens up the full editor so all the reports and everything are there. So they work really nicely together. Oh, where did we go? Um, so a couple of people have asked if there's a lifetime option for Fictionary or is it just an annual um, subscription? We do have, well, we have an annual and our system has a limit on the max we can put in as a five year. Um, but we haven't really done it much. But if anybody wants to do that, I'm happy to talk to them about it. <laughs> okay. Um, should they just get in touch via your contact page? Yeah, right on the contact page. They, I, that comes right to me. It says helpful editor, but it's that's me. <laughs> okay. Well, if you sign up, you get a you get an email from Christina into your to your inbox. So can they just hit reply to that as well? Yeah, they can. Absolutely. The other thing I wanted to say about signing up is the person who asked the question at the beginning about. Are they going to get the charts? If you sign up for our free trial, there's no obligation to keep going. You don't have to put in a credit card. Um, but with that, every uh, five days, you'll get um, a lesson of our story editing co course, which goes in depth into every one of the topics I've covered. So if you want it, that's a way, that's a way for you to get it. Oh, that's good. Okay, great. Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, someone says they wonder when writers and editors advise plot arcs and story structures if being too much the same does it encourage a proliferation of formulaic plot lines are, are you encouraging homogeneity here we get this question yeah. a lot of pro writing aid as well yeah yeah and the goal is no we don't want to do that every story is different and every writer is bringing a different perspective to their story and the the idea of looking at a structure is to say okay the story's not working. So you read a story and it's not working. You need a way to figure out why isn't it working? You can't just read it and go, well, it's not working, fix it. You need to be able as an editor to look at it and go, okay, here are the places it's not working. And now you as the writer need to go away and write that. And I just strongly want to recommend it's not a formula. It's still your story. And 
we want all the different voices out there and we want people's voices to shine of what of what you're writing but at the same time we want to help you make a powerful story that that people are emotionally involved in and so um we don't want people to follow exactly we want them to think about it to use it to make it better well i always think that if as there's as much as you can learn from published writing you know the best-selling authors people that are out there if they're doing things that are working to engage their readers then you know learn from that and figure out what you can get from it so I, I, I was reading something recently and their inciting incident took like such a long time to come and i i didn't realize until after the fact that i was feeling quite irritated by the book because it wasn't getting to the point where i felt like i should and so i felt sort of vaguely unsatisfied by the whole experience and so readers i mean for years for their whole lives they've been reading books that sort of do follow this general plot and so if it doesn't somehow it, that echoes in their in their mind and they realize it and, and and maybe it doesn't quite work and so if you do want to go off if you want to write something really crazy and postmodern and experimental and everything do it go for it but do it purposefully and think about what you're doing and why you want to be different and how the experience for your reader is going to be different because you've done it a different way. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Does Fictionary allow me to use different structures depending on my genre? Does it do anything different depending, suggest anything different depending on whether it's a thriller or a romance? No, it's based on commercial fiction in general and it's not um it's not genre specific at all so we would look to the writer to know their genre and what they're writing okay great uh we're running out of time a little bit here i'm just scrolling through all the questions trying to figure out what we've answered and what we haven't um are there any last I'll just have a look through and see if there's anything that I think is really specific for us to call. But is there any last words you want to leave everyone with? Last words, yes. Enjoy Famous the time. Words. <laughs> My favorite last words are take advantage of this time at home and find something you love to do. And if it's writing, write. If it's something else, do that. But you know, I'm just trying to find the the good bits around this whole crazy thing and you know, look for those little pieces of happiness in the day, which has nothing to do with this webinar or anything at all, but it's a hard time for everyone. And so if we can all just keep finding little pieces that make us happy during the day, someday this will be over. Yeah, and come hang out with us. I mean, we're, this is what we're doing to keep ourselves busy and to find our joy. Um, Haley from Pro Writing Aid is hosting these write-ins where we all just meet up online and we we kind of just ignore each other for chunks of time with a bit of music playing and which she gives us challenges and it's really because it's hard to focus right now with everything that's going on it's i'm finding it really helpful for getting creative again and getting past a bit of a block um yeah so come along and, and tomorrow night join us um we've got joellen nordstrom um coming in from from first editing and i've asked her to help us learn to work with an editor how to get the most out of your editor how to make sure that you're getting your money's worth and um so she's going to help us try and figure out that relationship and how how to make how to get the best um and make sure that your money is well spent so um have a look at the blog post on with the full list of events and uh, a couple more are going to be added tomorrow um and thank you for being here thank you christina I, I, for this sorry. Hey, one more thing here. I'm just reading the comments flashing by really quickly and you, you guys have left me feeling wonderful. Um, there's so many thank yous and someone said, oh, Christina's a nice person. And, <laughs> okay, so yay. So I'm going to leave this just feeling really good. So thank you to everybody at the end who's just saying all the thank yous. It's really <laughs> no, it's so nice. Thanks for everyone for sticking around. I really appreciate it. Um, and, I'm, and I'm sorry that we didn't get through all the questions. There were just so many, but um, yeah, get in touch. Christina's really good about answering any questions about Fictionary and go there and give it a try if you want. And this bundle that we've put together is, I mean, that's saving you a good chunk of change if you think that you've got something that you're going to be working on um, in the next little while. And okay, great. That's it. Thanks again for being here. Terrific. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.